what is happening and why should I care if I'm a homeowner? This is the piece that I think is most important. I'll say it again. Why should I care? Why should Mrs. Jones care about this post you just made? That's the hard part as a painter because I know why you should care about prep. I still fail at it sometimes. Like you got to write these captions like somebody who's a lay person is reading them and is considering a paint job right now. Welcome to the Painter Growth Podcast, where we help you scale your painting company in record time. Join us as we explore sales, marketing, hiring, finances, leadership, and more, everything that you need to know to scale and grow your painting business. I hope you enjoy and subscribe. What's up, everybody? Uh, Mike Gorhickman here, founder of PainterGrowth.com. I almost forgot how I start the podcast every time. Um, and you're listening to the Painter Growth Podcast. And today we are joined by the legendary ZK Painting, Zach Kenny. Just about half a million subs across platforms, crushing on the social game. The difference in Zach's approach, though, that he sets himself apart from most of the other painting influencers that I've seen is that Zach's approach on social media growth is to drive revenue, not just to drive followers. So the, the leading metric that he optimizes for is revenue growth in his painting business. And I think that is the most applicable thing for painters listening to this to use. So what's up, Zach? Good to have you, man. It's good to be here. Yeah, I think this is going to be, uh, I mean, I had you, we had you on, uh, on one of our coaching calls uh, last week and the amount of value that you provided for the group there was incredible. So I hope you can, you know, eclipse how much value you uh you provided uh internally so let's just uh let's just jump in i guess origin story We've got to bore people with how we got here um why painting uh i got it was a punishment uh, i was talking to my mom the other day i don't remember exactly what i did but i was 15 years old and i uh, i had to be i had to go on a saturday and paint a picnic table at my mom's nonprofit daycare and a man saw me painting it and actually had a, like 50 more. He had a bunch of picnic tables that needed to be painted. Um, and he was paying some kid who was going really slow. And I was going really fast because I was trying to be done with it. And uh, I got my first job. And I just I was like the instant gratification of making things beautiful with paint. And I didn't have a lot of other options. And, uh, you know, but it, it was a, a passion. It, the passion for making things really nice was kind of instant. I'm, I was a bit of a, per, a perfectionist. And so I was always like taking too long. All my bosses were like, dude, like hurry up. We're not, like, this isn't, they need to be perfect. Like, let's go. We got to put paint on things. I was a terrible employee. <laughs> I think most entrepreneurs were terrible employees. Um, so I imagine when you were doing those, uh, those picnic tables, you weren't doing like ultra high gloss finish. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, not even close. I, I probably had a nasty brush. I, I, I'm sure I was painting out of the can at that point. No, actually, I think like I, I knew enough to not do that. That's like the worst painting out of the can. Can't do that. Yeah. You got to pour it out of the pour in a little pail. Yeah. Okay. Make it so much easier. Yeah. So you got started there. When did you decide to start your own painting business? So I, moved home 15 14 15 years ago uh, i was living in philadelphia working for a, a guy there uh i came home and didn't have any other option like i had to come home for some family stuff and i was like i borrowed a little like i think it was like a thousand dollars i paid for this ford taurus and uh i stuck a little giant ladder in the back of it and a friend's dad paid me $15 an hour cash to go paint a flip house he was doing. Um, and we, I did that. And again, way too detailed. Um, I'm sure he didn't do well financially on the painting I did because it was too detailed for a, a flip near the airport. Um, but that sort of just like out of pure desperation, I needed to pay rent, pay bills, eat, and I had to survive. And so, and I was not very employable. I, I, you know, I was just a bad employee. So it would have been hard to get a job. I don't want a job. So I just started like working for anyone who would pay me. Um, kind of freelancing, subcontracting. Yeah. Just like if you, if you had something to paint, I would paint it. If you had a, you name it, I would do it. 
Um, but I was always, I was definitely always, I took a lot of pride in the work. And so I was always pushing the limits of the craft. I was always way over delivering for what I charged. Uh, never made any money in painting for the first decade. Um, How many years have you been in business now? Uh, I think this is our fifth, coming up on 15. Okay. And how many how many years did it take for you to figure out like what was the growth trajectory like like over the first decade? Uh, it was bad. The first, so I'm an addict in recovery, so I was like smoking weed. I, I've been clean for a little over ten years. Congratulations! Um, congratulations. But back then, like I was not, and then, so I was like, you know, I was just I was all over the place. I was just trying to survive. Um, and it took me a long time before it was the PCA that really like, which was about five years ago. I went to my first PCA expo. I only wanted to talk about how to put paint on things. And all these guys wanted to talk about business of painting. And uh, it really changed the way I looked at my business. Um, and then sort of paired that with the social media stuff where like, you know, um, my marketing before social media was just like praying that the phone would ring. Um, that's a, Somebody else told me that that's what their dad used to do. And I was like, that's exactly what, that was my strategy as well. I, I wasn't actually praying, but like, I was just hoping that the phone would ring. That's, that was like my strategy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so leads were few and far between, and I had to close every lead I got, um, which is not a good position to be in. I think that's why I suffered for so long um, because I was pretty desperate every time I went to look at a project. I was pretty how did you that. learn? How did you learn the business side of things? Just like pure grit and 10 years of trial and error? Or like, what, what did you do to kind of fast forward your growth on the business skills? Uh, there, I would say, so there was about nine years where I didn't listen to music and I only listened to non like nonfiction books on audible or podcasts, educational podcasts. Um, so I, I was pretty, at a certain point I realized like, I don't know what I'm doing at all. And no one in my life knows. So like, I better figure out how to find success. And there's all this information out there. And I started with podcasts and then they would lead me to book recommendations. And then I was just, and I was driving a lot and I was working a lot. So I was consuming a lot of content. And I, and honestly, I just read a, hundreds and hundreds of books and listened to lots of podcasts. That's how it started. Um, but I think even with that, you can only go so far alone. Um, and, and so when the, when the um, the PCA kind of came up, oh, I would I read every single post on PaintTalk.com. <laughs> awesome. Uh, I spent a lot of time there. So it sounds like it sounds like, and uh, forgive my uh, my pun, but it sounds like you gave yourself up to a higher power. Yeah. Learning of learning of uh, painting, learning of the business side of it. It was. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot to be said for like just clear data, knowing where you stand, knowing what yeah. you're good at, knowing what you're not good at. And it, it became pretty clear. It took me like hitting my head against the wall a hundred times before I moved. What was like the biggest there. aha moment that you can think of that you had during that like educate? Because that's like thousands of hours of learning, right? Like, did you have any like aha moments where like, oh man, I get it now? I would say not in the learning process. Like I'm a big... Like I consume a lot of books and I, but I couldn't like tell you the names of all the authors. I couldn't write you like biography or uh, whatever. I couldn't write you descriptions of these books and tell you all the quote, all this stuff from them generally. But I think I like you put all that stuff in the back of your head and your subconscious, and then you just got to see the world in a different way. So I think most of my, like the real turning point for me was, was, like it's, it was internal for me. It was like belief in oneself. Like I think for, you know, I, as a hu as humans, we, we set our bar in a way that like we believe is attainable. Cause if you set your bar too high, like, you know, that can be some negative feedback loops and you never get there and you can feel like you're never making any headway. So I think generally, like, I know I, for me, like I had these like goals and aspirations or ideas of what I thought I could do. Um, and those just kept, I think as I, as I started to learn more and practice more, those started to like elevate and get higher and higher of like sort of what I thought I could, was capable of doing. 
Um, and then what I, and then I would do something and I would, I would get to the next level. And I just sort of like, I just kept going like little by little by little to the next level, the next level, the next level. Um, and I think at a certain point, and it continues to happen to this day, like you have, I have these goals and ideas of what I want to do, but as when you get to that next level, you know, your idea of where you might go expands. Yep. That's how I would say the, the top of the mountain is a mirage. Right. You get to the top of the mountain, you realize you're just at the bottom of being bigger mountain. Yeah. And, and if you thought about trying to get to the third mountain when you were down at the very beginning, like you wouldn't even start. No, I mean, it, it would be so paralyzing. But for like when you just like a little bit at a time, get a positive feedback loop, get some success, get some for me, it was a lot of like mental health stuff, self-confidence of like, oh, yeah, I can do this. Like, oh, I can do this. Like. You know, I, four years ago, I was on a podcast and I was like, I want to have a year uh, queue. I want to have work workbook for a year and I want to be $130 an hour. Like that was my goal. I want to have a few guys. I just had so much PTSD from not having work. Yeah. That like I that just, scarcity mindset. Yeah. I thought I, I didn't understand the business of like having in business. Hopefully we have little nut like uh, valves where we can turn on leads. And we can turn on production and we can like start to play with the business side of business. But in the beginning, I didn't have a valve I could turn to increase mm. leads. And so I, from this scarcity mindset, I thought, oh, I just want to like stay small, raise my prices and have a, have a be on retainer with clients and have a long waiting list that would yeah. keep me safe. Yeah. That's like the, the safety net. You, you felt the need to have like basically the entrepreneurial equivalent of a pension. Yeah. I just wanted that safety um, because it, because of my paradigm at that time, I I didn't know that you could have a machine, a marketing machine and that you could like have a, a valve where you could turn on, like you could work to add, increase leads. You know, that was sort of something that just organically happened in my business for most of the time yeah. until social media. So, I mean, tell me about that. What made you decide to, I mean, everyone, everyone has an Instagram page, right? Everyone has an Instagram page. You know, many people have, you know, YouTube channels and Facebook pages and stuff, but, but yours is obviously different. So when you first signed up for a business Instagram page, was it just to be like everyone else? Or like, what was the, what was the mindset going into signing up for Instagram? No, at the time it it was not like everyone else. There was not very many people there. Okay. What year was this? We have to look back. I think it was like six, five, six years ago. Okay. Probably six years ago at this point. Sure. I mean, it's still, that's still fairly recent in, in social media terms. Yeah. It was, uh, it was very different than, than it is now. As far as like, there were painters on there for sure. There were people on there before me, but not much. I mean, I don't think there was a lot of paint contractors there two years before me. Sure. Three years before, you know, it was, it's now it's become like, yeah. But I, and honestly, my uh, my partner at the time, she was like, she was on social media. I was not. I didn't want anything to do with it. And uh, she encouraged me. She started the page for me at one point, and uh, I was very against it. I was just like this curmudgeon old man, and I was just like, why do I want people to like my stuff? Who cares? Blah blah blah. But uh, you know, I started posting stuff, and. Uh, I, I like games and I'm competitive and I was honestly, I was just trying to get those numbers to go up. Um, and so I was sort of doing that, you know, very half ass for a while. And then one morning I woke up on a Sunday morning. I never forget my, one of my, my brother's best friend texted me uh, a picture, a screenshot of one of my videos that had gone viral in Brazil on a Brazilian painter's channel. I, I was spraying a fence with stain um, and it went, it had like 5 million views and I was like, what? But it was on Facebook. I had posted on Instagram. He had, did, he did give me credit, but like it didn't drive traffic to my Instagram page because it was cross platform. And that was like six years ago. So that was what sort of just like piqued my interest. I was like, Oh, interesting. Like there's something here. Um, and I reshared it on Instagram and I think it sort of, it sort of went viral on my page a little bit. Um, and then I just sort of like started playing the game of, uh, 
how do I grow a following? Um, and I didn't have anything else to do. I had, I had made a switch about that same time to only using fine paints of Europe. So I didn't have any clients who wanted to pay me to use fine paints of Europe. And I was already struggling to sell jobs at the prices I was trying, I wanted to do the high level work. And then I added this whole other thing. And so I was very slow, uh, but I was very passionate. I had a lot of time on my hands um, and I was reading a lot of books. Gary Vee was pretty influential back then. I was reading a lot, trying a lot, failing a lot and um, figured out how to grow a following at a certain point. Um, and then at a certain point, someone was like, well, why are you growing a following? Like, what's the point of that? When I was about 20,000 followers, I think it was 10 or 20,000. You know, first it was like, get to 10. So you get like the new features. And yeah. I was like, okay, I'm chasing 10. And then you get to 10 and you're like, all right. And at some point they were like, why are you doing this? And I didn't have an answer. Um, and so it was at that point where I sort of, I switched what I was trying to do from growing a following to growing a revenue stream to, I would say, tracking leads and getting business from Instagram. And when I made that mindset shift, um, my content changed a lot. My following slowed growth, slowed way down um, and, and has continued to. And I've taken periods of time off and and I've not tried to grow the, the page for most of the time I've been on Instagram, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, very focused on growing revenue. And, and that blew my company up. Like I was doing a couple hundred thousand in revenue when I started on social media and we did like 3.2 last year. And, um, it was like, a, and that was from 1.1 1 .1 or 1 1.2 the year before that. So it, it's Almost entirely been, lead driven from social media. Yeah. 95% of it's from Instagram. Yeah. Um, there's not a lot of jobs we do today that didn't start somehow through social media. So what would you say is like the main difference in, in type of content and focus when you're creating content to drive, you know, followers versus sales? Well, I think the, the key, the key, the first thing is like pretty much everything anyone's heard about and reads about social media is not applicable to driving revenue for your business in social media. Like, that that's a thing that as soon as you you have to stop googling how do i what do i do on social media like most social media talks are going to be about influencer style marketing influencer driven how do i grow a following how do i hack the algorithm how do i do all this like that stuff doesn't drive revenue until you get to a huge scale going viral in brazil doesn't make paint people paint their house in massachusetts 100 percent. and so really what it comes down to is it's a straw like social media has dropped has driven revenue for my business over five million dollars at this point from a strong referral really that's what it comes down to is this is a much more powerful way for someone who likes my me and my business today to tell their friend about what i do um or to find out about what i do and then do homework and then want to buy from me um, it's that strong referral. And so if you're thinking about it through that lens, that means somebody sent your post to a friend or somebody was told about your post and then searched you and went to your page intentionally. So that's a very different style of, of person who's going to like, they're going to go deep, right? They're going to read your captions. There's, a, there's not a lot of talk about like deep, detailed captions when you're trying to grow, go viral, right? No one cares about the You just captions. want the ASMR content to make people yeah. share it. Viral content doesn't care about captions, right? I care deeply about detailed captions because if someone's going to buy a paint job from me, they're going to read my captions mm -hmm. and I'm going to educate them and, and I'm going to tell them why they should, like I'm going to answer all their sales questions in my social media posts. Right. And I think that's a that's a fairly different take on social media than I've ever heard really talked about um, in. And it's not easy to do. I will say I, I, I'm I'm right now I'm in, a, in the process of trying to grow my following again. I've begun posting daily, if not twice a day, uh, reels, trying to hit some viral videos, some satisfying content. But I also mix in there that revenue driving stuff, the 
just pictures with the detailed caption. Um, and I think it, when you're when you're just focusing on talking to your ideal client, answering their questions, all the questions you get in the sales process, answer them through posts on social media. And when you do that, those posts don't get a lot of likes and follows or likes and views and, and comments. They're, they're not super engaging content, but they do educate your consumer, your, your potential client on what it's like to buy from you before they buy from you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really what, we're, what I'm trying to do is like, I want people to come to my social media page and have a very clear understanding of what it's like to do business with ZK Painting before they pick up the phone. And when you see social media through that lens, um, I think it's 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 not easy to do because when you make a post, that the whole the whole algorithm, the the system, everything is designed to get people to create content and try to chase more engagement. Right? There's all sorts of the like button right there, how many views you get, everyone's tracking followers, looking at their insights. I don't ever look at my insights. Like honestly, I I couldn't tell you the last time I went and looked at how many followers do I have? What's my engagement like? How many people see my story? I have no idea. Those metrics don't matter to me. They don't pay my bills. I think the metrics you want to care about are how many people are asking for paint jobs from you and saying they heard about you or saw you or referencing your social media. How do you track that? First thing I ask everybody, how did you hear about us? When, when somebody calls and they want a paint job, uh, first thing I can say, you aggregate those responses somewhere. You put it in their profile on your CRM. Yeah. Well, at this point, it's 95% social media, but yes, it, it's in our CRM. It's, it's mm -hmm. you put it in there, and, but it's, it's very rare that it wouldn't at this point, right? It would have to be like somebody I met in real life who was not connected to anyone in social media that I've ever had who then just talked to me and got my phone number and called me, right? Like everything people are doing to hear about my business and see my business is coming through social media in one way, shape or form. And most of the time that's like, Miss Jones loved using us and she told her friend and she used my social media as a way of telling her friend. I mean, there's there is a certain level of credibility that just having a lot of followers lends to a homeowner seeing you. A lot of followers, but I would also like that's true for sure, social proof. But also, if you've posted consistent content for a year straight, there's a lot of there's a lot of trust that gets built there too. I think you're also nailed it when you said you want the homeowner to understand what it's like doing business with you before they do business with you. So if a, you know, a small painting company has a lot of posts where they're just like either talking through their process or just showing pictures of their neat, tidy, clean job sites or finished product projects or happy customers, um, that can accomplish that too with quite a you know low amount of work. Yeah, I think the big differentiator, if you were to look at my feed uh, and look at the posts that drive sales, um, a large majority of what I'm posting is process. It's not final photos, right? Because go to every single painter's website. There are beautiful finished photos of finished houses. That's not a differentiator, mm -hmm. right? If I were to look up painters in, in my area right now, everyone's website would have houses that were beautifully yeah, before and afters. That's the, that's the thing that you do, before right? I, it's just not a differentiator. Mm -hmm. Just like leading with, we do free estimates. Did anybody think they were going to pay for their estimate? Like when you start putting free estimates all over the place, I'm always just like, why? I don't, I don't understand. Like everyone assumes they're getting a free estimate. It's not a differentiator. It's not how I want to. Um, and I don't think it drives sales. I don't think pretty photos of paint jobs drive sales. I think process stuff to a person who doesn't, the problem that we have as painters is we know our trade too well. We're in the weeds of, understanding what we're seeing when we see a post about painting. But Miss Jones, she she's doing a million things in her life and she doesn't know painting the way we know painting. So we have to educate her as to why we sand and clean, right? Why am I why do I cost more to do cabinets than the other guy? 
Well, I'm going to show you. Like, look at how detailed our process is. And then in the caption, I'm going to write all about why I cleaned this and how I cleaned it. And here's a video or I would say first just pictures. Like, here's some pictures of clean stuff. Here's a pro here's a caption of like, you know, why I cleaned and what I cleaned with. And what does that mean to you? Right. I can't just be like, oh, I clean the cabinets. Well, I know why I clean the cabinets. Other painters will know why you clean the cabinets. But if you make a post, it's like, wow, we clean the cabinets. Miss Jones is like, I don't, why? I don't, I don't know. Like, what does that mean? But it's like, you know, we clean cabinets because we need our coatings to stick to the coatings that are already there. And the most durable paint in the world, if it's not stuck to the other coat of paint, is going to fail. All right. Well, that's just demonstrated some expertise. So she's going to feel more confident hiring my company than the company who's just like, oh, we painted cabinets. Free estimates. Free estimates. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you have you have also established quite an like a very visually appealing uh, niche, right? You get this, you get this fine paints of Europe, you get these ultra high gloss finishes. They're beautiful. So they lend themselves really well to social media. But I think all painting, I mean, there's so many like cool, satisfying things that we do as painters that are, would make really good viral video content. It's just not, you know, you just need that like creative mind to be able to look at, okay, how do I best capture this? So it looks good on video. Viral videos and creating satisfying videos and content is it is a muscle, and it takes skill. It takes trial. So and your error. first video that I make is not going to be viral. No, man. Sorry, Damn. I can't guarantee. I can't like. I got a. I buy lottery tickets when I make viral videos. I'm I'm buying lottery tickets, and I'm and I'm hoping that this one will hit. But honestly, the ones that hit sometimes I'm like, wow. Sometimes I'm like, I'll edit, you're like, this is the one, and then just nothing. And then next time, you know, one you never thought was going to go, goes. But honestly, I, like we talked about, I, I don't want to spend too much time talking about this stuff. I don't think that, I, I don't want, unless you are driving a million plus in revenue from Instagram, don't focus on viral videos. That's not going to do anything for you, right? But to your point, the, I get this a lot. And I've thought a lot about this. People are like, well, you're doing really good on, well on social media because you do really beautiful stuff. And I don't do that. All right. But that that is not true. Like I might I have a larger following probably because I can make some I, I have some videos that are, are satisfying. But that's not even true because there's guys that have much larger followings than me who are just painting walls and slapping on paint on exteriors in a way that gives me that makes me cringe. But they figured out how to capture their content in an interesting way. And that's a whole skill set in and of itself. You're literally doing a time lapse of a wall, a wall color change. Like it goes incredibly viral. And you can shoot that in different ways. You could put yeah. a camera on it and have it never go viral because you shot it and captured it in a terrible way. So, but so to the point, the back to, and again, I don't want to talk too much about viral because that's all anyone talks about with social media is how do I grow a following? How do I get viral content? And it doesn't drive revenue. So like, let's just stay away from that. But back to like, okay, I do find shiny stuff. That's why you get revenue from Instagram. Like that, no one says that sentence though, because it really doesn't make a lot of sense, right? What it is, is I am documenting what I do and I'm speaking to my ideal client. So my ideal client does really value the look of the paint job. They're, they're spending seven to $10,000 to paint a front door, right? They value a lot how that door looks at the end, right? So when you see that, you see, oh, this guy's got shut. No, 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 I'm speaking to my ideal client. My client cares a lot about visual and aesthetics, right? But they also care a lot about expertise, speed. I, I try to demonstrate that we have a large team that we can get things done quickly. But to the, to the a painter who's not serving my market, if you're doing just, you're just doing res repaints, your average job size is five to $6,000. Your buyer buys because of different things, right? Your buyer is not buying because the trim looks like cabinetry, like my buyer does. So I have to show off trim that looks like cabinetry to educate people that this is possible. And if you have the kind of budget that my clients have, I can give you this, right? So I do that. But if your client buys because you answer the phone and you show up, and you give an estimate right away and then you do the work and it just gets done. And you're the easy button and you're a professional company. 
right? And you're reasonably priced. All right. Well, then we got to make content around that. Again, it's going to be even less uh, engagement. It's going to get less engagement than my stuff gets. So we have to be cool with like nine likes on this post. Because if this post drives revenue, why are we tracking likes? Like it's so hard to do it, but it's like speak to your ideal client. Why do your clients buy from you? Like everyone should be able to answer pretty concisely. What are the two or three things that people like would say are why they buy from you? Whatever that is, we're going to create content that demonstrates and says those things. So it could be very boring in many instances. But for the right for the right consumer that's looking at the content and it, during their buying window, it will be like music to their ears. Music to their ears. Oh my God, you just answered my question about whatever. Yeah. One thing that I've that like a lot of people don't realize, a lot of painters don't realize is like homeowners don't get estimates for painting very often. Like it's not a thing that they get a lot of times in their life. So they don't know what it what it looks like. So there's like a big question mark. And whenever there's uncertainty in someone's buying process, most of the time the average person will choose inaction when there's uncertainty. So you have the ability through these social videos or even just still post to like, what does the estimate look like? What can I expect? Like things like that. Yeah. When you could really get into it, you could go super deep on the most, bo like, honestly, just your metric should be, is this post boring? Good. Like it, and that's, that's the thing of like, when people talk about social media, they're all trying to talk about how to get engagement. This bizarre concept that somebody would be on their explore page and they would be searching their explore page and your content would pop up. They would happen to live in your area and then they would want to buy a paint job from you. Like the statistics on that are wild in a bad way, not in a good way. <laughs> like that's just not how revenue is going to come from social media. But when you have a client, so I think it's, it's important to get Google reviews, right? Everyone's kind of on board with that at this point. I think it's far more important to get follows from leads, from prospects, not even clients. Anyone who, who reaches out to you, you should have a system of how can you get them to follow you at the highest possible rate? Because people who might want to buy from you or who have, who have bought from you, if they are following you, will turn into more revenue. They will refer your, their friends to you through the, your social media if it's done right. Like that's how we need to be thinking about social media is. Do you think that that Instagram had like the algorithm, if if you do send like 20 people who are leads or clients of yours to follow you and they do, will your account get, do you think it'll get like promoted to other like-minded people? That's far more likely because the algorithm is very good at finding people the content that they want. But again, it's probably unlikely because we're not trying to make super satisfying content that requires a, a bunch of time and energy and is a super, it's a skill that's very hard. And if you can figure it out, you can make a lot of money doing this for not paint companies. Like there are a lot of companies out there who are looking for people who actually understand how to make great content on social media. It's very hard to do. It's, it's a skill. I've honed it to a point where like, for me, I'm just like, obviously. And then I have my guys or people in my life. I'm like, here, will you shoot this and like record this? And like, and it just doesn't come out nearly the same. And then I realized like, oh, I've spent seven years of my life obsessing on how to create content that would be satisfying and viral. Mm -hmm. So how would you, um, so you mentioned earlier and you mentioned last week when you're, when you're on our team meeting that for the average painter right now, not even to bother with the video. I wouldn't just go still. I, I think that I'm very into how do we make this the least amount of effort for the maximum reward? Like if you have 40 hours a week and you want to go ham on social media for the next two years. All right, cool. Like video is your answer. Go. But for most business owners, I think for most people out there, it's like, how do I spend the least amount of time and get the most payoff? I'm running a business. I want this to be one more thing that I do. And for, for those people, I would say stick to photos, well edited. We You can edit a photo on your iPhone in 10 seconds. 
you take a photo again there's some little bit of skill of like framing the shot so you don't like take a cabinet and like cut off the corner of the cabinet and then take the picture like get the thing in in frame right did you ever take any of those like online courses on like how to shoot videos or i haven't and i probably should like it would be beneficial but you train yourself i've sort of you just train yourself does like does it look good does this look good just does it pass the smell test like because honestly professional photography is almost a turnoff now to our clients right it's too clean it's too perfect it doesn't feel real it feels like our website this perfectly curated thing over here we're trying to let people know what it's like to hire us authenticity is is everything on social media look at all the biggest influencers all the biggest everything the people who are finding success on social media are being authentic and so i think actually not having a professionally shot photo of everything is is fine it's good but don't have it be like full of shadows and dark like you can brighten up a photo by moving the exposure over and the sh take the shadows out in the editing on an iphone in less than five minutes from the iphone itself no extra programs right just learning how to like very simply brighten up a photo that's for the most part that's all i ever do is just get rid of the shadows brighten it up make sure there's not like empty coca-cola cans cups or something on the counter right basic little things but just like take a picture of your your prep process and then write me a detailed caption as to what is happening and why should I care if I'm a homeowner? This is the piece that I think is most important. I'll say it again. Why should I care? Why should Mrs. Jones care about this post you just made? That's the hard part as a painter because I know why you should care about prep. I still fail at it sometimes. Like you got to write these captions like somebody who's a lay person is reading them and is considering a paint job right now what how do we talk in the sales process when we're in the home all right well that's how we should talk in our social media posts would you ever i mean some people just like abhor the idea of sitting down and writing a short story would you ever use like an ai tool like chat gpt to help out with the writing or no, that's not authentic never. Enough? so the voice of your i mean we all in element in english class we all got rated on our i mean i did at least you got rated on voice it was one of the categories of an essay yeah how much yeah, is this from, like voice. you or is this just dry as and dry as hell is voice like if every one of your posts every single time it sounds the same well this company is dry and sarcastic all right dry and sarcastic is your voice make it but what we don't want is we don't want it to sound like the intern from a social media marketing company wrote this caption. A, a, a person who doesn't <laughs> know anything about the company or anything about painting. They are writing the most vanilla. But so most people, I, I'm sorry if you are paying someone to manage your social media right now, organic social media, um, they're probably doing this. If you look at all of your captions, there are like, I ran a social media company. I got rid, I was a partner in one and I left because there was a lot of conflict about this exact topic. Like how authentic are, are these captions? If some 22 year old kid who's never held a paintbrush in their lives is writing a caption about your painting company. No, I have the sales guy at, at, at a bare minimum, the sale, have the salesperson write the captions. Right. So let's, so let's just, let's just run through a, a, a an example of what's of like a piece of content that someone can do. So your average house painter paints interiors, exteriors, 90% residential. Um, and they want to take an image and then write a caption. So say we take an image of a prep process. Say we have like a wall patched up with a whole yeah. bunch of whatever putty on it or whatever you, everyone spackle. There you go. <laughs> it's all spackled up. You take a picture of it. Okay. You adjust the brightness, adjust yeah. the contrast, make it look pretty. Upload it to Instagram as a as a post. As a post, square post. Square post. Yep. And then you start writing a caption. What's the framework that they should follow? As part of our process for painting walls, we use such and such spackle. We sand the wall and then we spackle the imperfections with 
spackle. We, we fill the imperfections with spackle and sand them smooth before we spot prime and put paint on. This allows, this gives you a more aesthetically pleasing wall when the project is complete. Simple documentary of like, here's what, here's what we're doing and here's why we did it. Cause it's going to look good after. Yeah. Right. It, it doesn't have to be crazy. It doesn't have to be full of, you know, just like, so here's what we did and here's why you should care. And that can be for everything. Here's what we did and here's why you should care. And I think the piece that most people don't do is most people are not writing why you should care at all. And if they do write, here's what we did there. It's like, they're doing it at a, at a craftsmanship forum with a bunch of other craft people. Like, you know, we use 220 on this and uh, then we, then we finished it. Well, like, what is 220? You know, it's not an easy thing to do. And I, I, I'm glad we're having this conversation because I'm going to write my caption. I'm going to be even better at my captions next week because it really is like, think about how you would talk about that process in the sales process with Miss Jones. Well, you know, see all these nail holes, do, do these, all these screw pops, do they, they bother you? Yeah. I don't like them. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll fix them as part of our scope. Well, then when you fix them, I would be, I would start with a picture of the patched hole. And then I'd have another picture of the dugout hole with the screw there. The next picture of, of sort of a before. I don't want to lead with a before. I'd rather the after be the first picture. and then or the, the next, or the in process. Yeah, or the in process. Like the after meaning just like the, the finish of the process. Yeah, okay. So that it's sort of like, okay, here's a, here's a puttied wall. And then here's the before. And then here's the process along the way. So you might have four or five pictures, yeah, two or three pictures of just screw nail pops being filled. Um, that you can go with like, here's how we mask and protect your kitchen cabinets. You know, here's a picture of masking and some plastic, and we mask off the insides of all your cabinetry. You don't have to, or you do, depends on how your company is. Like, you don't have to remove all the things from inside of your kitchen cabinets for me to paint them. I just need them off two inches off the, off the edge. Here's a picture of that. And then here's a picture of the plastic that I put in. And this way, the th your food doesn't get paint on it when I spray your cabinets. Now, Ms. Jones, who I just had a client ask me that yesterday, two days ago, do I have to empty all my kitchen cabinets out before you paint them? I was like, no, you just got to make sure. I just need to make sure that they're empty enough that I can mask in there. Um, but it's, I mean, that stuff's really boring, right? Like that's not going to get a lot of engagement, but if I was thinking about having my kitchen cabinets painted and you gave me five or six posts about your kitchen cabinet process, and then you put them in a highlight that said cabinets and I could go and I could do my homework. So this is the thing, like if I'm going to buy a paint job from you, I'll read your stuff. Like every, I mean, I don't go on a project anymore and the client hasn't like researched and knows my last 30 posts like that's what they're there for I, i'm making them so that you can understand what our capacities are what we do what we can do um so that's one right there the the number one one that every painter should be doing is just a simple case study miss jones called me she wanted the exterior of her house painted uh within the within six weeks of the phone call or maybe she just wanted her house painted and she didn't care when we did it, whatever it was the case. How, what did she say in the phone? She was really concerned about her dog being let out of the backyard fence. So we made sure to not let the dog out. We washed the house. We did this, we did this, and we gave her a paint job that's going to do this, this, and this, and she's happy, right? It's, it's so much more than like finish another house like another one in the books or whatever. I see lots of captions that are like a sentence that just says like, we painted a house. But if I'm thinking about buying a, a paint job from you and you tell me the story about a client who had some needs and how you use your expertise to solve those needs. And then she was happy at the end. I might put myself in her shoes and go, 
well, maybe you could solve my unique needs. They're not exactly, I mean, I don't have a dog, but I have this, this, and this. And, it, and so if, if all of our posts are pretty clear case studies of like what happened and some unique things that show that like we care and we're good at what we do, well, then the potential buyer is going to read those and be like, they could probably do this for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that like you're the way that you're describing using social media is like it's 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 so simplistic like when you when you kind of lay it out like that it makes a lot of sense and it seems like in the way that you do it it shouldn't take a lot of time no. if you're just doing a post like one post a day or even two posts a day of like some process you're doing and then write a caption like that should take maybe 10 minutes i made my post this morning in under five minutes it is one of these posts i can even read it um my post this morning was a picture of a finished room and then the a process picture and then the before picture and then a, a two more process pictures. And it says, we use three coats of a lime paint on the brick as well as about 10 plus tubes of masonry caulking to meticulously fill every gap so that we wouldn't have any shadows. The lime paint is great because it's breathable and won't fail if the brick gets wet down the road. We also added in a few bricks to to fill the large gap at the top. The ceiling was double oil primed. Another 10 plus tubes of caulking were used to fill every void. And then two coats of a matte enamel were applied. Now I made a mistake there and I'm gonna go back. I should have said, I should have answered to the client, why did we double oil prime, right? Again, I'm too in the weeds with my stuff. I didn't say we double oil prime because there's clear water stains. The water stains will bleed through the first coat of primer. So we use two coats of primer to stop any water stains from bleeding through. I, I'm going to add that mm -hmm. podcast. And then I said, we used, uh, we used tape to draw the line on the wall in preparation for the steel and glass wall that's being built that will connect at the joint. Right. And this has a uh, very poor engagement today for, for me, it's like way below anything I'd ever normally do. Like if I was trying to make satisfying content. Yeah. Um, but that answered a number of questions to a potential buyer. Um, it, it demonstrates my capacities. It demonstrates product knowledge. And it shows a beautiful finished product. It shows my, my job sites are take, well taken care of. Like that process photo is a beautiful picture yeah. of the work being done and how clean and neat our sh job sites are. Yeah. Right? This does not look like your average job site. No. I mean, that was a $300,000 paint job. Yeah. But the, the point is, it doesn't matter. That could be a $6,000 paint job. Did you answer your potential client's questions? And did you educate them? And did you demonstrate expertise? And so one thing, I, I'm sharing it on, on the, the screen share if anyone wants to look at the Spotify video or whatever. Um, interesting, the one comment is a developer who is your ideal client for some, this type of process. Yeah, that, yeah, that's a, a friend of mine, actually. Um, and that's it. Like, so my experience with my types of clients, and I would imagine this is true for most clients. So the person who reads this post and buys from me down the road, they will never like it. They will never comment on it. Mo I don't think I've ever had, I've maybe one or two clients ever comment on my stuff clients that bought for me of the 5 million in revenue, maybe one or two times. It's super rare. You know, just cause clients, just because somebody doesn't like it or comment on it doesn't mean they didn't read it four times and fully did digest and understand what was there. That's the thing about the metrics of social media. We don't want to track. We don't care. I don't care how many likes I get on that post. I mean, personally, I much more care about revenue than likes. Yeah. Unless you want to be an absolute statistical anomaly at this point and be a full on social media influencer. And you want to literally create and, and that dude, it, we could go a whole thing about that. But that's there are conferences. There's there's infinite amounts of content about that. But that's very, very hard to do. It's like trying to very be, competitive, very competitive and very few people win. So that's like, oh, I want to go be a professional basketball player. All right. If it works out, like you will do very well. 
but most people are not going to do that. So like, maybe we shouldn't be studying like the professional basketball players stuff, but everyone can like earn a living as a painter and do well. Like mm-hmm. that is very possible to make great money as a, as a painting contractor. Yeah. It, but it's, you know, it, it, you're not, comp- you're only competing against yourself. There's an essentially an infinite number of, of positions for great paint contractors. There's only so many spots on an NBA team. One other thing that I wanted to quickly just bring up that you didn't mention today yet is um, I think a lot of people are concerned with like, how do I make a ton of content? Like, how do I come keep, keep coming up with fresh ideas every day? You don't have to. Because again, we are, we only care that the last 30 pieces of content and 30 plus are, are good. So if it, if you post twice a month, twice a week, it, it will take you longer to get 30, 40 posts that are good, but like it's fine. And then going forward, you'll be good. Like it doesn't have to, this does not have to be there. That's why it's, as I'm telling you pretty much everything you ever heard about social media, I want you to not, I want you to forget about like what time of day should I post? The hashtags are no longer a thing anymore. The algorithm is using your caption as hashtags, like to categorize your post, it's scanning your caption and using that like hashtags used to be used to categorize your post. way more advanced, way more advanced. So you don't need to put a bunch of hashtags in. I used to, for years, I was hashtagging like crazy. I would copy and paste 30 hashtags to every single post. But it, that's the thing. We don't care about what time of day, like all these things. We don't care. We're not talking about the algorithm ever. We're talking about if I like you and I want to tell my friend about you and I send the post, what is that experience going to be like? Is the bio really well written? Can I tell exactly what you do and where you do it? Right? The bio is is huge, right? Writing a clear bio that's like, here's like, you know, whatever you're going to say, but make sure that it's, it's answering your client's questions and it's on brand with what you do. You know, I, I see a lot of really poorly written bios, a lot of ugly bios. And if you do beautiful painting, ugly bios are not helping. <laughs> so you have a clean bio, um, use highlights. If you have a story or something like use those highlights frequently. Use ask questions. Highlights, man. I was just thinking about this today. Like next time I'm sick and I'm stuck at home, I have about a, an, a I have more than a full day probably of going through and curating all of my posts. I pretty much need to just scrap all my highlights at this point and start over and curate my entire 800 posts. And now I'm not saying every single one's going to go into a highlight, but if you want to, if you only want to know about cabinet painting and you go to my page right now, you have to scroll through a bunch of posts about doors and house painting to find cabinet painting posts. But with highlights, which now we're saying this, it's insane. I haven't done this sooner. I have highlights and you can see, but I have not been updating them. And it's it's pretty dated and it's not a great representation of what we do. It's, a, it's an okay representation. But what I should do and what I recommend everybody else do is figure out the categories that people are going to buy. Interior, exterior, cabinet painting, power washing, carpentry, the, the broad categories, cabinet painting, things that are sort of people ask you about specifically and then create content around those things. Like we talked about the whole process, not even necessarily like interior exterior, but for exterior, like maybe siding decks. I I would try to stick to broader. Okay. If you have not, I mean, it depends whatever resonates, but I think if I'm looking for exterior painting, I think decks are their own thing. Like stained wood, exterior stain, I would call it, or exterior decks and stain. But like, I think broadly speaking, exterior painting could kind of go together. Mm-hmm. You got to power wash it. You got to sand it. You got to prime it. You got to do a lot of the same stuff. The same type of buyers like cool seeing things like that. But how many times, how many painters out there, I wish we could see all of them raise their hands. How many times have you been asked, do you do interior and exterior? Like, that's the wildest question for a painter to be asked. Like, I think I know 
uh, it's far less than 1% of the market is only doing one, right? But yet that question gets asked constantly. <laughs> yeah. Because people aren't painters. They don't know. Like, we got to answer this stuff. Like, oh, do you do cabinet painting? Yeah, here's my process. So, like, highlights are a very great way of curating our feed for people. So, when we are 800 posts deep, like I am now, that uh, post from 400 posts ago doesn't just go into oblivion, which is what happens most of the time. Yeah. Yeah, it's like usable and accessible for your homeowner to come in, figure out, get what they want and get out. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about having my canvas painted. Answer my questions. Yeah. Any uh, any last kind of words of advice or tips for the average painting contractor who's like wants to get started, but for some reason is just their brain is not letting them? Yeah, I would say have faith this is going to work. So this is an exponential growth curve, right? It's a snowball. It, you got to start it really tiny. And when you get one, which essentially followers, like I, clients that are followers is what we're tracking first. And then we're going to track leads. And so have some faith. Like this stuff takes some time. From the time you start doing this to the time you get your first job from doing this might be a month or two. I, I've, I do some consulting with this and some of the people I've coached, it's like within a week or two. Um, but like, you don't know, right. You can't really, you can have a system and you can try to drive people there, but like, it'll, it might take a minute, but then the next one comes and then the next one comes. And mm -hmm. then in my experience, this is the network effect and the network effect is slow, 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 and then phew, powerful. So Try to have some faith, like just do this, commit to doing this. That's why I could say keep the bar really low. Like don't make this take 30 hours of your week. Keep the bar low, but stick to doing it and like trying to get better at it. Like don't just be like, oh, I just did it. Do it. When you do it, do it. But like don't spend a bunch of time. Try to get a little bit better and commit six months to it. Would you ever do voice voice memo to write your note and then go back and correct it? Yeah, whatever is going to make it faster for you. Yeah. Right? And and I go back and I'll, you know, sometimes comments will come up. Or like what I just did, I just reread it. Um, you reread it later in the day. Or you read some comments and you're like, oh, I got to like add some stuff to this caption. Because a lot of the, the sales you're going to get from your social media are going to come from people re seeing these posts days and days and days and weeks and months after they were created. You know, all that's completely different from this algorithm crap that everyone's talking about, right? People are going to read this stuff. And I guess last thing is that you're you're testing something out right now, right? You're you're actually looking to work with a few painters. I don't know if you have any spots left, but a couple painters just like on a one on one basis yeah. to help them implement kind of a social media roadmap. What's what's that all about? Yeah, so I have been so passionate about this for so long. Um, it changed my life. Like I was literally in tears at the talk, my talk at PCA because this really did change my life. I was broke and suffering and struggling. And I figured out how to do organic social media marketing and my life is completely changed. So I, I've almost started social media marketing companies multiple times since my last one I was a part of. Uh, but I realized that my competitive advantage here is not in creating, taking photos of things. I don't think that the average painter can afford uh, someone to do it for them. And so what I realized is I, I would much rather, I think I, for a, a small amount of, of investment, I can give the highest ROI by just coaching people on the, the plan. So what I do is I meet with people usually for a one to two hour phone call where I ask a bunch of questions to try to understand like their company, what makes them tick? Why are their buyers, buyers buy from them? Like what, what is this company? And then I work on a framework. I, I put together a, like, here's what we're going to post about. Here's who we're posting to very, very particular about these types of categories to say these types of things. So that when you wake up in the morning, you look at your blueprint and you're like, I'm going to create content around these categories that say these things. And it makes content creation so much easier. So whether you hire me to do it or not, like the thing I have not talked about is how important having a plan is. 
whatever it is, sit down and write this out. Why do people buy from me? Top of the list, two or three things. What's my, what's special about my company? Uh, I, how can I demonstrate those things, right? They're creative ideas of how can I demonstrate these things about why people buy from me, right? I'm really good at communication. All right, well, you can make content around your communication process. You can make content around your office staff. You can make content around your, your software that you use. You can make content around all the things that show you're really good, easy to do business with, right? But so you figure out what are the types of categories and then within each category, you can kind of come up with a few quick posts. And so I deliver that to somebody on a second call. We spent another hour or two going through that. And for the most part, right now, what I'm doing with people is I'm, I'm just saying, go, you know, for a few thousand dollars, you can have this, like the hard parts done. And there's like the best 20 posts in the world today, literally the best 20, they're not going to drive revenue tomorrow. This is a long game thing. So mostly what I want to do is help people start honing their process. And so that's sort of how the consulting looks like right now. Um, I've, I'm about to start working with uh, one other person who wants to go much deeper into the high level content creation stuff. Um, but that's, again, I don't really encourage most people <laughs> to do that. Yeah, not the average person. So if someone does want to apply to, to to take one of the spots to get coaching from you one on one, it's not with like a different person. It's with you personally. No. Yeah. We, we. How do they how can they get a hold of you? Uh, I would say DM me on Instagram. That's the best way. OK, or, it's not going to get lost in your sea of DMs. Yeah, hopefully not. I'm I'm pretty responsive there. Um, but also you can text me. OK. My number is four. You'd rather, you'd rather do a phone call, text message? I'd rather you text me than okay. email me for okay. sure. <laughs> I'll put your phone number in the uh, description below this. Yeah, put it in the description, but it's 401-935-8702. Perfect. I, I would much rather people text. I uh, email. And they're going like, to say, how did you, first question, how did you hear about me? How'd you hear about me? Painter Growth Podcast, baby. Sweet, Zach. Well, hey, man, um, congrats on your success on social media. I'm stoked for you for this next chapter on, on you know, helping other people find this within their businesses. Because, yeah, like you said, it can absolutely change lives, like just like it's changed yours. So um, congrats, man. Awesome Thanks, chatting with man. you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to the Painter Growth Podcast. If you want to grow your painting business, go to www.paintergrowth.com or click on the top link in the description. Talk soon.